I stand here. There's a difference between being a wandering generality and a meaningful specific. Where do you stand? Where do you stand in matters of faith? In the reading from Matthew, Jesus was at that very question. He was in the northern region of Jerusalem, of Israel, in the city of Caesarea Philippi. It was a remote area. Many scholars believe it was really a retreat that Jesus was having with his disciples because this was a, a hinged time in his ministry because Jesus then from that place would be going into Jerusalem. And so he's in this remote setting in Caesarea Philippi, and, and he just asks them, hey, where do you stand? What do you say? And we, we heard the various answers, and then... Peter got it right. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then right then, after that very first profession of the faith, Jesus said this. He said, on this rock, this rock, I will build my church. Now, Peter was the rock. He called him the rock because Peter, it's from the Greek word petros, like petrified. And his name literally meant rock or stone. However, it was not about Peter. It was about what he recognized that impressed Jesus. For he was the very first one to proclaim and, and to kind of get it right, and to make a stand, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Well, that declaration historically has become the church's foundation, and we're going to be spending a few weeks um, integrating how our faith finds expression in the way we do church uniquely as Christians who are organized congregationally. And one of the first hallmarks of our faith, and I would dare say of the Christian faith, that the first hallmark, we are a Christ-honoring church. Now you'll hear a lot about freedom in the congregational way. But be clear and be sure that historically, we are a community of Christ honorers, affirming that faith, that it is Jesus who is the head of the church. And when we say that Jesus is the head of the church, it begs the question, what's the church? What do you mean? What, is it some kind of stale institution? What is the church? Well, the answer really is there's really only one church. You can travel on Capitol Drive and you'll find various flavors of the church. But there is one church. For it is one body that has one head. That is Jesus the Christ. But still... Who is the church? That's an easy question to answer. In fact, my answer came as a child from Sunday school. It's part of the role of Sunday school, teaching the faith from generation to the other. And I remember the teacher saying, well, I'll, I'll explain to you kids what the church is. It's really how you spell the church. I go, what? And the teacher goes up on the blackboard. She wrote, C, H. You are the C-H. You are the church. It's not some organized ecclesiastical body. It's not some kind of franchise that allows a name to be stuck on a placard. You are the church. And essentially, the church is not a place we go, but it really is about 
a people, a community, a people we know. And we really don't go to church. We come to know the church. And by knowing the church, we become that community of Christ followers. So in the congregational tradition, that whole understanding of fellowship is a hallmark that we honor the Christ. And I think it is important to note, as we parallel the congregational way and the ways of the early Christians, we, there's a number of dynamic things that we can underscore. First, the early Christians, they weren't about going to church. They clearly, they were about being the church. And nowhere is that more apparent than what we heard in the reading, of the Acts of the Apostle. Where after Peter's Pentecost sermon, there was added 3,000 new believers that day with the gift and the birth of the church. 3,000 people today, that, that's a pretty amazing harvest. Because they've heard it for the first time. And we need to realize that a decision to believe is not all there is. And it was not all there was at that day when Peter preached that message in the power of the Spirit and people responded. It was not all there is. It was only the beginning. Like we say to our confirmation class, okay, students, you're confirmed, but it's just the beginning. We always are to grow in Christ. Now here's how the Bible described those characteristics or those hallmarks of the early church and what they were to those believers. We know that first of all, that early church, that was a learning church. It's a learning church. The early church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And you might say that on that day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit opened a school in Jerusalem the teachers were the apostles. And who were apostles? Apostles of that day, they were eyewitnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And the students of that school, it was those 3,000. They were the kindergartners learning for the first time the aspects of the faith. They had just enrolled in that. And they became learners at the apostles' feet which is also a hallmark of the congregational way. We are what you would call a truth-seeking fellowship. And underscored with that truth-seeking fellowship is how we experience freedom to come to know God, to love God, and worship God with heart, soul, and mind, as the scriptures declare. <laughs> there's, there's a humorous story. And there's a little bit of truth to it. And it goes something like this. If you ask a Catholic what they believe, a Catholic will say, well, the Pope says. If you ask a Baptist what they believe, they'll say, the Bible says. But if you ask a congregationalist what they believe, they'll say, well, I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> there, there is a difference. Uh, there is a difference. In congregational Christian churches historically, we believe that sincerity of conviction requires intellectual freedom. And we welcome relevant questions. If you go to our website, one of the first things you'll see says, this is a safe place to explore the claims of the Christian faith. And so, as congregational Christians, we are a truth-seeking church. Now, for sure, differences. Differences, it's inevitable. There's differences all around us. But there is a difference between differences and division. Division is a choice. 
But in our way of doing church, we can disagree and we can still love unconditionally. That is a value that we embrace as a church historically that I think it's time has really come because we have been losing that in our culture today. That differences, we seem to make them to divide us. But one of the great hallmarks of the early church, they were able to be a truth-seeking church that had a commitment to their way of glorifying and honoring Christ. The early church, as we find, was an unconditional loving church which really impressed the observers to that movement. The original Greek, if you look at what was used for the fellowship of those early Christians, it was from that Greek word koinea. There are churches that will have what they call koinea groups. And a koinea group, koinea literally means to hold something in common or to share something, not just to take up space in a room, but to share something in common. And we find that in 1 John where it says our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son and with Jesus Christ. And so the most precious thing that we can share in together is our connection with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when we share together, in him. All other differences can melt away. They don't matter so much. It goes back to where do you stand? As we heard from Carmen. Who is the Christ to you? And that's why if you look at history. The church. Was the first. Institution in history. Be proud of that. Be thankful of that. The church was the first institution in history to bring together, not to divide, but to bring together Jews and Gentiles, male and female, slave and freeman. There's nothing like that anywhere. Ours is not a divisive faith in that standpoint. We clearly state on who Jesus is, but we are also able to practice a way of integrating and not being a divisive movement, but a movement that is united in Christ and to also be able to embrace God's movement. So congregationalists, we are also connected with a covenant. This is where our historical practice is different from just about every other Christian organization. Congregations, they're bound together by a promise. We call it a covenant. Not a creed, not buying into, well, exactly, it's not that you own the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the Korean Creed. There's a number of creeds in our church, and they're wonderful. We, they, they, they help to, us to articulate our faith. That's wonderful. But what unites us as a community is our covenant. And many of you know that as we gather together, when persons join the church, when we have our congregational meetings, we have a covenant. And a covenant is very much like, like a couple getting married. They make a promise to want to do all that they can to care for each other, to love for each other in the best of times and also in the roughest of times. So we are a covenant-connected church. Every member, every member has a vote on establishing policy, on the work of the church, while Jesus is our head, the ultimate authority and decision-making is you are the church. It's us as a community. And we live in a time and an era where our, th our culture and maybe even our unbelieving culture 
would treasure that value if they only knew that's the way that they could do church to where it's not something that is imposed on someone else but that collectively together we talk we share we pray we make decisions and in making decisions we work together as the church of jesus christ well earlier in the book of acts before the reading that pastor jackie shared with us we find these words, and I like to close with this, and it's also from Acts, the second chapter, and it's one of the most phenomenal passages that I've ever read in the scriptures, where it says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams, and in those days I will pour out my spirit upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I appreciate that passage that's talking about the hope we have in the future church. And as part of that which we embrace as core values of the congregation away, and that is something for the young and something that God has for the older. Young people, now they're in the other room. Some may be online. God wants to use you now. There's... You've probably been told, we tell our young people, and even some of our young adults, we say, you're the future church. That's not exactly accurate. You're not the future church. You're the church today. You're the church right now. You're never too young or too busy to do good for God. You're never too young to help people. You're never too young to make a difference in the lives of people. And then he also talks about how older men will dream dreams. <laughs> older people, listen to me, okay? Where are we? Oh, we're all over the place. Okay, there we go, all right. We're not old. Maybe we get a little confused with technology. <laughs> but, um, we're really not that old. I like what there, there was Satchel Page, who um, was, I think he was the oldest major league player to pitch a game at age 59, which is old to be playing in the major leagues. He said, age is merely a matter of mind, and if you don't mind, it, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Just as young people are told, oh, you're going to be the future church, Sometimes older people act like, well, we were the church of yesterday. And what have you got? No one's making any difference. We were the church of yesterday as if their chance or their obligation somehow became irrelevant with years of wisdom and experience when you can make your best contribution it's not over, believe me. So it's never too old to do something dynamic in the kingdom that God has allowed us to be a part of. God is not through with you until God calls us home. And so in this first installment, in this series where we're wanting to look at, at the unique way that we are organized as a community of Christ followers, we realize that the congregational way, we are a Christ-honoring, truth-seeking, covenant community of believers. So if you're ever with anyone and say, well, what's the congregational church? Well, you can say, well, we're the oldest church in the, in the United States. Our historical roots are with the pilgrims. We were here before anyone else. Be thankful for that. We're also a part of the Christian church that brought people together in their differences before any other institution on the face of the earth. Don't let anyone degrade or make Christians look foolish. There's a lot that we can say, thank you, Lord, for it. And so I conclude also with, with that song. Where are you? 
be a wondering generality or a meaningful specific. Those of us who choose to be Christian first, who choose to be organized congregationally, we honor Christ, we want to seek the truth, and at the same time, we're connected together through a covenant. Our concluding hymn is Lift High the Cross. Would you stand, and as you consider your life, uh, maybe you've been a wandering generality, you want to be a meaningful specific, I want to encourage you to, uh, to consider the congregational way as a way to live out your faith. Let us sing.